before I minister, I, uh, you know, I read a lot of books. I love books. Books are my friends. And um, I just hope when I get to heaven, there's this great big room and all these books. I just love books. They'll probably have all kinds of different books there. But uh, I, there's, so uh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll uh, encourage you uh, to check out a book I'm reading. And um, one person that has been a real mentor of mine, I did meet Lester Sumrall. In fact, he was in a, a small town in North Carolina back in, wow, 1990, uh, one. And uh, so the pastor asked me, of all people, to take Lester Sumrall's Bible and books and attache case to the office for him, and I got to walk beside my mentor. So Lester Sumrall uh, died in 1996. He was 83 years young. But there's a book that I've been reading. You can hardly put this book down. It's called The Life of Lester Sumrall. So I have the digital copy, and I'm reading that. And uh, but this is an amazing. You can hardly put this down. He had an amazing life. When he, when he came to Jesus at age 18, God showed him. He had tuberculosis and was literally coughing up his lungs. It's awful. And, uh, and he was laying in bed about to die. Everybody had given up. The doctors had given up. And he saw a casket on one side of the room and a Bible on the other. And God said, you choose what you want. He said, I think I'll take the Bible. And so that meant he had to preach. So God called him to preach. From the time he made Jesus Lord, and this is a phenomenal book, and he went to a, over a hundred nations of the world and uh, preached the gospel. It's just a really, really a phenomenal book. Started uh, TV stations towards the end of his life, and when I lived in Tulsa, he had a TV station there, and we'd watch his stuff. I actually have his information on MP3 in my truck, so I'm tooling down the road. I'm listening to MP3s by Lester Sumrall. He's so uh, encouraging. Uh, Lester Sumrall the noted English evangelist who had 23 people raised from the dead under his ministry actually laid hands on Lester uh, back in the 40s before he died and said, God, let the, let the anointing and faith that's in me be upon this young man. And it, it played out in his life really amazing. So the life of Lester Summerall. If you read that, you'll be a better person, I would say. So read your Bible first, but then read that. That'd be good. Is that good? That was free. Y'all here? All right. Y'all ready? So, Lord, take the word of God, minister life, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Uh, I may not get done tonight. I'm good with that. I'm trying to get done on, at a good time because you got kids in school and you got jobs and such. I get it. I, I want to talk about and I want to address the issue of being faithful. We're living in an unfaithful age. Would you agree with that? And people are doing that which is right in their own eyes. Uh, that's the way the book of Judges ends. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. That seems to be America and uh, a large portion of the world these days. So faithfulness is a quality that God looks for in every life that he uses. And I learned that as a young man when I was 18. I was in church 18 years, and there's so many things I didn't understand. I just didn't connect the dots. But once I really, really gave my life to Jesus as an almost 18-year-old, and God started getting into the Word of God. One of the one of the principles that I never had really understood, but I saw clearly was the principle of being a faithful person. And if you'll learn the principle of faithfulness, what will happen is one day you'll stand before Jesus and you want to hear these words, well doing good and faithful servant. You'll hear those words if you learn the principle of faithfulness and attach it to your life and become a faithful person yourself. So uh, can I challenge you tonight? That was a little anemic. Come on. You ready for a good challenge? So I just want to talk to you about your personal faithfulness. Faithfulness is, and I'm going to start with the definition. It's down in the notes. Uh, the quality or state of being faithful, of course, well, hey. Well, so what is faithful? True or constant in affection or allegiance, loyal, firm in adherence to promises, oaths, undertakings, uh, firm and thorough in the observance of duty. Uh, I really like that first part. True or constant in affection and allegiance. You never have to think, is the sun rising tonight? Well, if I look up and there's a clear sky, will I see the stars? You never have to think, uh, will the sun rise in the morning? Will it set at a certain time? God's faithful, right? And that's uh, just the way he is. So, you know, the natural things of life that God's in charge of, he said it, and it's the way it is, and it follows his character of faithfulness. So we want to emulate that in our lives. God is absolutely faithful. We sing songs about this. Lamentations 3. 22 and 23, New King James, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. How many are glad about that? Then verse 23, they are new every morning. Great. Everybody say great. 
is your faithfulness. See? So one of the most, again, uh, important character traits we can develop is uh, that of faithfulness. So really, when God looks at a person's life, he looks for the quality of faithfulness in them. And, and that's the first thing he looks at. I'm in ministry today um, because as a young man, I chose the, the root of faithfulness. If you want to find the purpose and plan of God for your life, the first thing God looks for is a person uh, that is faithful. And uh, so I've got six things that we need to know about faithfulness here. And uh, I don't, we'll see how far I get because, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit, when I speak, you understand, when I speak, uh, I'm intuitive as I speak and I feel things, then the Holy Spirit speaks. And so I might go here or go there. But because I'm a pastor, I have that permission and I can come back next week. Is that all right? So the first thing about faithfulness, and this is a big deal, at at the judgment seat of Christ. In my notes, I say at Christ's reward seat because that word for judgment is really uh, the word for the elevated chair uh, in the Olympic Games in in uh, in Rome of Bible days when the uh, athletes would be running a race or whatever, the person judging the race and watching to see who was first and if they had followed all the rules, rules was sitting on an elevated chair and could see everything and everybody. And that is the that was the bema b e m a seat, and that's literally the word here for the judgment or rewards the bema seat of Christ. Uh, again, it's a reward seat. We use the word word judgment seat of Christ that has a negative connotation. If you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you're in heaven. So nobody that that is unsaved that will spend eternity in the lake of fire will be before the judgment seat of Christ. They'll be at the great white throne judgment. There's a big difference there. But only believers will be at this at this reward seat, judgment seat, reward seat of Christ. And uh, we stand before there. You know, I'm, I'm not going to stand there and, and uh, you're going to stand there and be judged for what God called you to do. And were you faithful, and was I faithful to what God asked of me? Not going to be, not going to be rewarded for what I did unless what I did was in sync with what He wanted me to do. Does that make sense? So, so you know, you could, you could do a lot of things and be really popular, but if God's not in your stuff, you get there and say, "What, what are you up to?" All right. So, it's faithfulness He's looking for, and that's that's a big challenge. Um, I think I'm going to skip here at Romans 14, 10, but why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? And for those that don't, my notes are always online. You can always go to today's uh, 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 lesson online and, and check it out. So I'm skipping down a little bit here in the notes. Romans 14, 10, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord. Every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then and he's talking to believers here. So each of us shall give account of himself to God. So as you know, as you're tooling through every day, uh, it's a, it should be a frequent thought. Well, what am I going to say to Jesus about what I'm doing right now? <laughs> you know, because uh, we're going to give an account. That's the issue. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 Verse 11, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. This is the judgment seat of Christ, the reward seat of Christ. Um, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So you got six substances there, gold, silver, precious stones. When, when fire hits them, it just refines them. But wood, hay, and straw is consumed and just turns to smoke when fire hits it. So, you know, I think all of us have an accumulation of both, don't you? So you're standing before Jesus on that day, and you look down at your feet, probably all you see is stubble, and then Jesus comes by and pfft, all that, you got a whisk of smoke. You ever thought about that? And you look down, and hopefully you're going to see some glimmering things, gold, silver, jewels. You know, oh, hopefully so, right? So y'all not smiling very much about that. But that's, that's reality, right? So I don't know if you think about that. I do. I read a book in 1990 uh, from a pastor in California, and he actually um, uh, 
Who's the founder of the Salvation Army? William Booth had a, had a vision, actually, and he sent some books about him. And he actually saw the, the judgment seat of Christ. And this pastor in California had a very similar... Had a, there it is. Look at you, Rick Howard. Judgment seat of Christ. And, uh, uh, and it's in the book. And he had a very similar uh, vision that uh, William Booth had in that uh, the scenes in heaven. And this pastor had friends that he knew all around him. And he knew that they were at the judgment seat of Christ. He looked at everybody and they had the, they had the twigs. I mean, the, you know... Uh, wood, hay, and straw at their feet. He did too. And Jesus is going along and he had this little torch in his hand and, and everywhere he went, he would just look at the person, talk to him a minute and then just touch him with that. And, 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 you know, a big whisk of smoke. And he said, you heard two sounds, guttural sobs and ecstatic, ecstatic shouting. And I never forgot that. And, uh, I just hope I do more shouting than sobbing. When I get there, you know what I'm saying? And, and again, when the smoke clears. So that's something we have to be aware of. And while I was speaking, I, there's one scripture that I left out of my notes that I do want to read since I'm on that particular subject. And because we're talking about faithfulness and we're talking about the reward seat of Christ. Uh, and I need to go to my Amplified New Testament. So here it is here. For we must appear, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, not in my notes. For we must all appear and be revealed as we are. See, as we are. How many know you can put a facade on and everybody sees what they think is an upright person and everything's wonderful, but see, God sees through the veil and sees us and sees our heart, sees why we do what we do. Do we do it uh, for self-congratulations? Do we do it to be seen and heard? Or do we do it because we, number one, genuinely love Jesus and secondly, genuinely love people? So if you do the right thing with the wrong motive, how many know there's no reward? That's wood, hay, straw. But if you do the right thing with the right motive, that's gold, silver, jewels, right? So we want the gold, silver, jewels. So we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive his pay according to what he's done in the body, whether good or evil, considering what his purpose and motive have been, what he's achieved, been busy with, giving himself as in his attention to accomplishing. So, wow, nobody knows our motives but the Lord and us. And sometimes we mask our motives, don't we? And that's why if you get quiet, you know, you can you can kind of pick up on is that am I doing what I'm doing to be seen and heard uh, to congratulate myself or others to congratulate me or am I am I doing what I do I uh, do because I genuinely care for people so you know and those things you have to deal with because uh, we live in a really strange world and there's a lot of reasons people do a lot of things so anyway that's just an idea that we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ the reward seat and you know you want to hear those well done words so. Again, uh, faithfulness will get you there. So talk about it. Number two, faithfulness allows the gifts God places in us to develop. Um, it opens the door for God's purposes uh, for us. Uh, let me say this. You know, a lot of people want God to speak to them. You know, unless you're doing the things you know to do, God probably won't speak a whole lot to you, right? So, so if you know to do good and do not do it to you, it's sin, Scripture says. So... Again, I mean, just being faithful to the Lord, uh, reading His Word, God and His Word are one, uh, having a devotional time. You don't get brownie points with God by having a devotional time. But, you know, when I want His Word, when I want to read His Word, when I want to not just read but obey His Word, and what I want to fellowship with Him in prayer, those are just fundamentals that keep us spiritually strong. Yes or no? And then we have to fellowship with each other. And then, then all, those are important. Those are important things. So, again, you know, if we're not doing the fundamental things, and, and uh, we're not uh, taking heed to the written word, then it's probably not very likely that the Holy Spirit's going to come with, a, with, a, with the word of God spoken to a heart, a specific, the Greek word is rhema word, that, that is specific for you in a particular situation you're in. Unless you're just generally obeying what God, you know God has said to you. How many hear me? So this faithfulness, it's all involved in so many things we are and do as believers. Matthew twenty two fourteen, Jesus said, Many are called, but few are chosen. So again, uh, in a, uh, I'm talking in an overall way. We find our place in the family of God by being faithful. So while I'm saying that, ask yourself the question, um, am I being faithful? Am I being faithful in the things I know that I should be doing with the Lord. And again, this is not, this is not to, to, to be pleasing to Him. No, th this is, this is so that God can open up His best for your life. How many understand that? So the quality of faithfulness is all important. Paul was called to be an apostle. Um, 
I would say from the foundations of the world, and just like you and I, God saw us in Jesus before we were born. Is that true? Psalm 139 is clear. Uh, every day of our life was mapped out, you know, prior to our birth. Paul was an, called to be an apostle, but it, but he was called and then he was separated to the call. Listen to what he said in Romans 1, 1. This is New King James. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, and then separated under the gospel of God. See, there's a, there's a span of time between what God wants you to do and then you actually doing it or being separated to it, like Paul said. And, and the, the, that expanse of time, how long it is, how long it takes or whatever has a lot to do with us being faithful in the small things. And, and if, if, if we'll show the quality of faithfulness, it makes it a whole lot easier for us to be called to something and then realize it and then enter into it. And so Jesus said, many are called, few are chosen. Why would he say something so startling and, and scary? Well, because many people, many people are called to do a lot of things, but the ones that really enter, enter into it are the ones that show themselves faithful. So it's a real principle of Scripture that in 2023, how many know we need to get a hold of? Yes or no? So again, just to say it again, there's a time between the call then the separation to what God's called you to do. And I'm not talking about being called to be a pastor or being a missionary, being an evangelist or anything. I'm just talking about the call of God on you. How many believe that every single believer has the call of God on you? You've got the call of God to go into all world and preach the gospel to every creature, you know, and use words, as some people say, when necessary, with your lifestyle. Preach with your life. We all have that call. But then we have individual giftings that God places in our lives. Some people are gifted to... Uh, sing. Others are gifted to just help in all kinds of various ways. Some people are gifted with children, with youth. Some people are gifted, uh, really gifted with, uh, with helping the down and out and helping those that, that, uh, just need a, need a loving hand. And there's just lots of giftings. Uh, Romans 12 is clear about that. And then we have the, we have the, um, uh, the offices that Jesus set in the church in Ephesians 4. Here, I'm just simply talking about what God has gifted you, you to do. Both that he placed in you innately uh, when you came to him and that he saw in you before you were born. The thing that separates us to that is faithfulness. Just a few scriptures about faithfulness. Proverbs twenty-eight twenty. A faithful man. Man, again, is generic for humankind, so men and women. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Now, I read that back when I was... 18 years old, and that really astounded me, a faithful person. So it made me think, am I a faithful person? Because if you're faithful, how many know you'll abound? The blessings will come on you. First Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, the apostle Paul said this, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required in stewards that one be found faithful. Uh, amplified of that says, Moreover, it's essentially required of stewards that a man should be found faithful and in brackets, proving himself worthy of trust. I like that. So we have to prove ourselves that we can be trustworthy. How many of you know if you're trustworthy in the small thing, you'll be trustworthy in the large thing? So whatever we do, I say it this way, whatever I do in the little, I'll do in the big. Huh? Uh, you know, uh, I've, <laughs> I've been in ministry since 1981, and I, you don't know how many people have come to me and say, well, I'm getting a windfall. I'm getting a lot of money from X, Y, Z. I say, well, that's really nice. Well, when I get it, I'm going to tie. I'm going to tie. I say, well, that's great. And I've t- had them tell me, yeah, it's going to be, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Do you know I've never not one time? <laughs> not one time. <laughs> you know why it had to happen? You know why? You know why? Because, because if you're not tithing on the $10 you get, Huh? That then if the big windfall comes, you won't do that either. So what you do in the little, you do in the big, right? It just works that way. So the attitude I have in the small things is the attitude I'll have in the large things. And I'll tell you, a lot of life is a test. And a lot of times the, the things that happen to us uh, and the things we go through and the path our life takes as we venture into the world God has placed us in, uh, a lot of it we don't realize it, but he's watching and he's just checking out to see what kind of attitudes we have, what motivations we have, and if we'll follow through on the commitments that that we have mentioned and that he's placed in front of us. How many hear me? So um, the question is, the question is this, and I've got two of them in my notes here. In what way have I proven myself faithful to God? How, how would you answer that? 
I mean, right now, if Jesus came, came and asked you, are you faithful? And he goes, oh, yeah, well, how are you faithful? Answer that for yourself. Uh, can God trust you? Here's another question, big question. Can God trust you with the responsibility he wants to give you? Wow, that's a big one, isn't it? Um, so, so let me also say this. God will often ask us to do something that's far beyond us, uh, sometimes far beyond what we like or what we want to do, or sometimes God will place us in a place that has a need, and he won't say anything to us about it. There's a need that presents itself. Somebody needs to help with that need, and he's going to see who's going to step up to the plate without being asked. You get that? So, so that's, that's, a, that's a really, really big deal to him. So I don't know how it worked out for me, but somehow I guess the first Bible school I went to was uh, in 1970, uh, actually 76 at night classes, and we had a Bible school in the church, and they always had all kinds of things that need to be done around the church grounds and such. We had uh, uh, students that lived on campus, and, you know, it was a busy place and had a lot going on, so they always needed help in some way. And and I learned right then just, just to find there were always needs, and if I would just... Uh, ask them, could I help? They always let me. And, and that's where faithfulness started. I didn't realize what the principle would do. I didn't realize the growth that it would allow in my life. I didn't realize where that faithfulness in small, small things would, would take me. So, uh, I, I think, uh, in these days now, you know, one of the first ways to be faithful to the Lord is to be faithful to a local church. Yes or no? And, and faithful to come in body and be there. A lot of people, because of the internet and the convenience of online things, uh, have given themselves permission not to be involved in a local church and not to be involved in helping others. The question I present to anybody like that, and I love you that are watching online. Some people can't get out of their home. I understand that if you're an elderly person, yada, yada, I get it. Uh, or maybe you're watching from another state, I get that too. But if you're in the Raleigh area and you're in, in good health and you can get, you ought to be here. Because there's something in your spiritual life, there's something in our spiritual lives we miss when we don't reach out and help someone else with the help wherewith we've been helped. Is that true? So, so you know, there's just something to be said about that. Um, you know, um, just thinking along these lines of just being faithful in small things, um, uh, you just be amazed at how God will ask you to do things that seem to be um, out of your league you're unable to do. Uh, Susan and I, right after we were married in 1979, I'll tell a small part of the story. We found ourselves in a, I had never been to a Pentecostal church in my life. And we found ourselves that we had a, I had a well, actually, the guy that lived in the uh, apartments we lived in right beside us was a Pentecostal pastor. We met him and his wife and had some fellowship with him and such. I started attending his church. And I mean, right away, he, he found out I was a graduate of a Bible school. He said, well, I want you to come and I want you to teach the adult Sunday school class. I'm like 21 years old. It's like, can you do that? And, and the people in the class were in their 50s and 60s and 70s. I'm like, they need to tell me stuff about life. What are you talking about? So, you know, I found myself doing that. And, and you know, it was out of my comfort zone. And I was uncomfortable preparing. I was uncomfortable speaking. I was uncomfortable the whole nine yards with that. But you know what? God did that to stretch me. And, and in some ways, because I was willing to do it, uh, it said something to the Lord, and he kept opening this door and opening that door. How many hear what I'm saying? Uh, uh, I was like 23 years old um, living in Tulsa after another Bible school experience, and um, uh, they needed people to help visit five hospitals in the Tulsa area. Uh, it was a large church, and, and people and their families would have family members and extended family in the hospital. And they would ask people to go visit and uh, the hospitals and, and to volunteer. And uh, I put my name down. I said, well, I'm going to go. God didn't tell me to do that. I just saw there was a need. And I said, well, nobody else is going to step up. I'll do it myself. Let's go. And, uh, and I started going. And I'm going to tell you something. I was, I was so uncomfortable going into the hospital room, meeting a complete stranger. And here's what I found out. Some people don't want you in the hospital room. And some people are so glad they'll about hug you, your neck off, you know, so to speak. And they're so happy and so glad. But others, you, you can tell, it's like a family member wanted, wanted someone to visit them from their church. This person doesn't know the Lord, doesn't want to know the Lord, and doesn't want you because you know the Lord. But I found all kinds of situations, but you know what I found out? It helped me grow. It helped me understand, you know, just the ambiance of a room, the atmosphere. It helped me understand how to deal with people that 
liked me, that didn't like me, and help me understand all the different kinds of personalities you'll meet just as a human being and then as a believer. And it helped me uh, figure out and learn how to deal with people uh, who were kind, who were unkind, sometimes people who were obstinate. But, you know, it was difficult. I'm just saying that sometimes when God asks you, asks you to do something, it's not something you would normally do, and that was not something I would normally do. But, see, I grew out of it. The next thing that happened to me right after that, um, uh, my, I've been to three Bible schools, second Bible school experience. You've heard the story, but when I, I the, the church I attended, they asked me to come on to be a maintenance man, and that's a glorified name for a janitor. And I mean, I, I thought, <laughs> you got to be kidding. So uh, it was a big church, big building, 63,500 square feet, dozens of toilets to clean, you know, lots of square foot of carpet to clean. And, uh, you know, and again, you've heard me say all this, God's nasty people. I had to clean up after God's nasty people. And no, I shouldn't have said that, but, you know, if you go into some men's restrooms, there's nothing else that needs to be said. So I did all that. But you know what? God did a work inside of me just in the small thing. And, you know, again, the idea is if I couldn't do that with a smile and be willing to do it the rest of my life, see, I wouldn't qualify for the next phase that God had for me. So your life may not be exactly like mine. You might not be asked to do the kinds of things that the Lord has asked of me, sometimes not even asking, just putting it available and seeing if I would take the hook, if I would, if I would bite it. And, and God will do that. But you know what? God will place you in positions where you don't have to do it. Nobody's asking you to do it, but will you do it? And will you do it with a smile when it's not what you would prefer to do? He looks at all that. How many hear me? And it speaks to him really loud and really clear. Um, uh, 1 Timothy 1.12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me uh, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Um, I came across that way back in the um, early 80s and uh, in the mornings I still do. I read various translations of Scripture as I read through the Bible every year and I usually read through the New Testament, uh, uh, at least a gospel uh, the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles every month, and then the book of Revelation. Uh, so, and I change uh, translation. So here are several translations of 1 Timothy 1.12. I've gleaned over the years, and my wide margin Bible here, uh, they're written in the margin here of that Bible. Rotherham translation, uh, when he said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me. That word who has enabled me. Rotherham translation translates it, grateful am I to him that empowered me. Henry Alford translation, I give thanks to him who puts strength in me. Do you know God will strengthen you to do something that is an open door that you can help in ministry in some way or help others in some way? He'll give you the strength to do it when it seems like this ain't going to work for me. How many hear what I'm saying? New English Bible is my favorite. And I thank Christ Jesus, my Lord, who has made me equal to the task. So see, whatever God's got for you and whatever his purposes is for your life, he'll make you equal to the task. That means he gives you the ability to do it, even though in the initial stage, you might not have the desire for it. How many hear me? So here's what happens often Whatever our vocation of life is and whatever, in whatever way God uses us in the family of God, we usually don't start out there. How many hear that? You usually go through a series of events and prove in some smaller areas before God really opens up what he's got for you. How many understand that? And uh, Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. One one interpretation of that is God places in you what he wants you to do. The initial stage is he just wants you to be faithful and he might not tell you or might not reveal to you what he's got for you and what place you have in the body of Christ. But if you'll just be faithful with whatever your hand finds to do, how many know one day you will get there? Uh, I've got to skip around in my notes because I'm coming to a close here because I've got so much to say. I'm going to, I'm going to finish this up next week. Um, Luke 16, in fact, Psalm 75, listen to 6 and 7. Ex and this is under point number 5 if you're looking for it in the notes. For exaltation neither comes from the east nor the west nor the south, but God is the judge. Did you notice it didn't say anything about the north? God lives in the northern part of the universe, evidently, because he said it. 
Exhortation comes neither from the east, the west, the south, but God is the judge. What did he leave out? North. Is Mount Zion in the sides of the north, a city of the great king? Uh, anyway, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. So the idea there is God exalts us. If we exalt ourselves, we can fall on our face. But you know, when God exalts you to what he's got for you, uh, and it's because of faithfulness, I tell you, it'll bring his blessing into your life. Yes or no? Um, Luke 16, 10. I'll close with this. He who is faithful in, his, in which, what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Verse 12. If you've not been faithful in what is another man's, wow, who will give you what is your own? Now, that scripture says a lot. So, so it says several things. First, again, I mentioned it earlier. Whatever I do in the small thing, I'll do in the big thing. You know, there's no large and small to God. It's just doing what's right, regardless of what is set before you and what you're involved in. Yes or no? Right. So, but you know what you do in the thing that seeming is seemingly innocuous and makes no difference. That same character trait will carry through. In larger things. If I can't be faithful in the small thing, I won't be faithful in the big thing. And God looks at that and he sees that. How many hear me? And then this next part, if, you, if you're not faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you what is your own? You know, before I came here, I'll close with this illustration. Uh, before I came here, you know, I started out in ministry in Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, you've heard my stories the large church there, and I left there in 1988. Susan and I founded a church in a small town in South Carolina. And then from there, I turned that church over to a guy. They got it going and, and turned it over. And then I had a traveling ministry for two years and just traveled church to church teaching because I love to teach. And then, and then uh, I, and God opened the door, and, and I didn't want to do it. The honest truth is I did not want to do it. A pastor in my hometown, uh, Susan and I bought a house in my hometown while I was traveling, and actually while I was pastoring. And... Um, and then, you know, we had small children. We had three small children, eventually four. And uh, we had to have a, we needed to find a church. We were, we were, we were, we were traveling um, 70 miles one way to church, Sundays and Wednesdays. That's a long way when you got three small babies, right? And then I had one. Susan worked nights at a hospital, and I had a baby bottle. I, many times I drove 70 miles with a baby bottle stuck in Jessica, my my daughter was just born's mouth. You know, she's six months old. I got a baby bottle stuck right there, and I'm driving down 95 to get to a church we attended. So we decided that, you know, I need to start going to this church. We need to find something closer. You know, this is really hard. And uh, so we, we started attending a, a, a church uh, in my hometown, and I knew the pastor. I didn't know him well. But we started attending, and he found out I had been in ministry, and I'd been to Raymond. I had started churches and had traveling ministry, yada, yada. So he started talking to me, and he started saying, uh, I want you to come and be my associate pastor. I said at least a half a dozen times, I am not interested in being your associate pastor at all, across the board. I mean, I said it almost that, that terse, which maybe whatever. I just said I'm not interested. Well, he never gave up. He would call me every six weeks. Mitch, I want you to come and be my associate. I'm not interested in being your associate. So anyway, uh, bottom line was finally I acquiesced. And the Lord spoke to me, and uh, make a long story short, he said, you take that position and you become that man's associate pastor. I said, I don't want to be his associate pastor. And at that point, I knew it wasn't about what I wanted. It's about what God wanted. How many know sometimes God will have you do something that to you seems unreasonable and something you really rather not do? I'd rather not do it. That's how I, well, I said, Lord, no, no, I don't want to do it. And he finally said, Mitch, I want you to do that. There's a reason. Well... Well, I didn't know why. So he asked me the next time, Mitch, I want you to be my... I said, okay. <laughs> and, you know, after he almost picked himself off, off the floor, and I did it, I got involved there. Uh, the bottom line was, this verse came to pass in my life. If you're, if you're faithful in that which is least, you're faithful in much. And if you're unjust in least, you're unjust in much. And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you that which is your own? So September of uh, 1992... I was uh, I had a business I was running on the side and uh and I was his associate pastor as well he paid me a little bit to do that. Um and he took me to lunch one day in a, at a Mexican restaurant on Irby Street on Florence and uh at the end of the meeting he said well I got to tell you something he pushed himself away from the table and said and he had been to a missions trip to Latvia 
and to a small town. And he said, uh, I was on this mission trip. I, has, I said, uh-huh. And um, he said, while I was there, God spoke to me that he wanted me to move my whole family there and, and um, start a church in that little town. And I want you to take my church over for one year. I said, you got to be joking. He said, no. I said, wow. All I could say was, wow. And uh, so he did what he said. So come January of 93, second Sunday of uh, January of 93, he said bye to the congregation. And, uh, and I became his, uh, the pastor of the church in his stead. I was still associate, but I operated as pastor. And we supported him full time in Leopaya, Latvia, one of the Baltic states, right on the Baltic Sea. And uh, the whole year. And uh, he didn't come back for an entire year. I went to see him one time. Uh, but that I didn't realize what a test that was for me. I wasn't like him. I didn't uh, minister the way he did. Uh, there, we're, we're so different in so many ways. At the same time, we're good friends. And uh, I didn't realize the test that it was. And that whole year, I found myself, I mean, people would come up and they would say all kinds of things and had lots of opportunities to do it wrong. And I'll tell you a few examples. I don't know how many times people came up to me and we had cassette tapes at the time. And, uh, and they said, you know what? You, you preach ba- better than the pastor. I said, you know what? And they said, what? Don't you ever say that to me again. No, I don't preach better than the pastor. And, uh, and, I, and I went to the person duplicating cassette tapes at the time. I said, don't duplicate another tape. Nothing of me is going to be on tape. I'm done. Because I, I couldn't do that. And you can do the right thing for the wrong reason and not be blessed. How many know that? And so people would want to say X, Y, Z about the church and how. I said, you know what? That's not a conversation we're going to have. I'm here because God called me to do this. Your pastor is the man in, in Leopold, Latvia. He'll be back January of 94. I'm just associate here, and I'm doing what God called me to do. I didn't realize it was a huge test. Did you hear me? That was a huge test for me. And, uh, you know, I could have made a mess, but instead, God blessed us. It's, it took me about 20 more minutes to tell the story. The short of the story was the church grew. Uh, they actually had leased the property. We bought the property while he was gone. Uh, we, we updated a lot of things on the exterior of the building, just did a lot of stuff. The church actually grew. So when he came back in January of 94, I turned the church back over to him. And you know what? I didn't realize it, but I was a different person because I had did, I had done what, what Jesus said here. If you've not been faithful in what is another man's. And when he came back in January of 94, God had spoken to me a couple of months prior to that and let me know that I would be going to pastor a church that was already in existence that had no pastor. And it was right here. It was this church. It was on Garner Road in 1994. So if I had not been faithful in this thing, in serving the other pastor, in doing what was uncomfortable, in treating him, him with utmost respect and, and demanding that other people respect him when they wanted to talk behind his back. Did you know I would not be here today? Did you know that? So, so see, so when I talk about these things, these things are, are very real. And I want to encourage you, you know, if this is the church that God's planted you in, I can't, in, you know, I want you to stand before Jesus one day and I want you to hear those wonderful words. Well done. Good end. What kind of servant? So are you going to hear that? And I encourage you. There's lots of opportunities here for you to do things. We've got lots of people on our serve team. You can be a part of our serve team. I would encourage you to be a part of our serve team. I think it's always right. We'll say, Pastor, what should I do? I say, well, what do you want to do? And then, and then secondly, I would say, just get involved and do something. And now it, better, it would be better to do something than nothing. Let me stop with this uh, by saying that a lot of people today don't value membership in a local church. Is that true or false? True. Uh, it's part of our culture. It's part of our culture to say, I don't want to be committed to any one thing. I want to do what I want to do. So if you have that kind of an attitude and you just come but don't serve other people, there's an element of your spiritual life that will not develop. And it could very well be that you don't find your place and the gifting that God placed inside of you because the only way to find it is by being faithful. And in a local church where you're a part, it's best to show your allegiance by, by just being faithful 
and being a part of that ministry and then being involved. When you do that, it stretches you because you're going to be around people that you'd rather not be around. And, and people are going to stretch you. You're going to find out none of us have halo on our heads. Halos on our heads that are all tarnished. You'll find out we're all, we all have faults and challenges and you'll find out how to walk in love. You can only find out how to walk in love with people who do unlovely things. Is that true? And all that happens, just being faithful. I could go through my life and, you know, I was on I was church staff for six years in Tulsa and I serve uh, the pastor there in South Carolina. And, and I can tell you, I've got a journal I keep and I don't know how many times in my journal uh, in Tulsa, for instance, I was in my 20s. And, and in my journal, I say, you know, the pastor said this, 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 he's doing this, this, this. I just don't see eye to eye, but I can't say anything to anybody about that. I need to make this a matter of prayer before God. God, you know my heart, search my heart about this. I mean, time after time after time after time, I so disagreed with the pastor. I look back now, I'm in my 60s, I was in my 20s. I look back on that and think, you know what? God was challenging my hide to see if I'd smile when I wanted to frown, to see if I'd gossip instead of keep my mouth shut. Thankfully, the day I left that ministry in Tulsa, thankfully, the pastor, it, it, I was standing in front of a thousand people on a Wednesday night. And he said, you know, Mitch has been on our staff for six years. And he said, not one time did I ever have to go into Mitch's office and reprimand him for anything. He said, he's, he's always been an example. He's one of the best employees we ever, all I could think about was, oh God, all that stuff, I, all that stuff I wanted to, Oh, God, all the stuff that was in my journal that God had to deal with my heart about, it never came out of my mouth. And I didn't realize that those were formative years in me. Does that make sense to you? So whether you're young or old, I'm telling you, what you're doing now sets the stage for what can, what God wants to and is able to do in your future. How many hear me? And then we'll answer about all of that at the reward seat of Christ. So, Father, I pray for every person in the room, including me, that, Lord, I, I want every person to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, help us to realize that when you, when you want us to do things, sometimes you ask us to do things we don't want to do. And sometimes we, you ask us and you put opportunities in front of us and you'll never speak. You just want to see if we'll go through the door. And of our own initiative, be faithful. Lord, these are proving ground days. Help us to prove ourselves to be faithful people. Minister life to us, Lord. And then, Lord, minister life through us in Jesus' name. Lord, it could be in this room there are people who are called to be in our children's ministry, the people called to help in the parking lot, greeting, ushering, uh, people to help with the youth, people on audiovisual, our online processes and all that. And it could be there are those here just called to pray and, and be in our prayer meetings and help lead small group leaders, just all kinds of things here. Lord, what are you saying to us? What is in front of us? Am I a faithful person? Lord, I, I pray that you would draw me to you, and that you would challenge me as a pastor in any area of my life that needs to come in sync with your purposes. And I pray for all of us that, above all, we would be found faithful. Lord, personally, I want to hear the words, well done. I want to hear them, Lord. Help me to walk in such a way that I will. Help me to change what I need to change, any attitudes or motivations. Let that be for every person in this room. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.